here. It's got all the same things, uh, all the same booths, all the same uh, farm animals. I'd love to go in and see all the animals in the big barn-like thing. In fact, I, 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 you know, the cows and everything. I'd love to smell that dairy air. <laughs> They have the same kind. They have all kinds of other other people selling things mm -hmm. and stuff, um, and you know the typical carny games and the rides and the lights. So there's a lot of booths. A lot of booths and all that. Um, but we're trying to decide whether we as a family should go on this beautiful Saturday. Uh, probably it's beautiful in Eagle River, but by the time we get to Palmer, it'll probably be raining. But, but, you know, we're supposed to decide, as a family, should we all go to the fair? And the kids all want to go to the fair. My wife wants to go to the fair because she loves going to the exhibit where they do the quilt show. She loves to, like, sit there and watch the lady, you know, showing the different quilts and talking about how they were made. Aww. One of the most boring things I can imagine attending, you know, so... While she is watching the quilt show, I'm usually sitting out on the bench watching the people on that rubber band thingy. You know, oh, the slingshot. Yeah, because I, I just love watching people scaring themselves to death on purpose no, for twenty-five dollars a piece. So I just don't get it. You know, that you know, it just shoots them up into the air and they go. <laughs> ah, I'm going to die. <laughs> You know how they do. So I usually just sit there watching them. But on this particular day, I was thinking I'd rather stay home and read Hegel on the back deck because it was so nice and sunny. So I thought, aha, well, I would get 25 hedons of pleasure from sitting on the back deck, right? But then my wife pointed out that Billy would get 25 hedons of going to the fair. Katie would get 25 Hedons of going to the fair. Christopher would get, you know. So basically, there's 125 Hedons if we go to the fair to 25 Hedons to stay home and let me read Hegel. So we went to the fair, right? You have to decide how do you get the greatest pleasure for the greatest number. Kind of a dumb example, but you get the idea, right? You know, somehow you have to figure out who gets the benefit uh, and so on. So, utility, you know, that's, you know, how do you do that, you know? Um, so, Jeremy Bentham, pretty important that way. And by the way, they had a lot of impact on law. And uh, so did John Stuart Mill. What's he famous for? Being ugly, probably. Having a great big <laughs> lump on his head, I think, would be part of it. And I don't know what caused the lump. You can see the lump there in all the pictures. We blurred it out a little bit on this one. But it's definitely there. Um, and uh, it's kind of neat. He was raised by his father, James who wanted to make sure that he had the best possible education. So instead of sending him to school, he trained him himself at home, which was pretty cool. The only thing was, uh, as a result of that, he couldn't go to university because in order to go to university, you had like, to have to graduate from a decent school. And since he just studied at home, he couldn't go to university. But it didn't matter. He ended up learning so much stuff uh, hot, I mean, his father would take him on walks every afternoon where he would have to recite all the things that he learned or discuss all the things he learned uh, the previous day or whatever, you know. So very, very stressful, actually, on him. Um, and when he was in his 20s, he ended up having a mental breakdown because he was so, you know, just, I, you know, Mentally broke, broken, basically. Uh, but he recovered from it and became a romantic. Ta-da! And not in the sense that he met like a young lady or something. Although eventually he did. And he ended up meeting a, a friend's wife whose name was Harriet Taylor. And they were just, you know, they were friends. You know, nothing odd about their relationship. 
Although, when the friend died, he did marry Harriet, and they did have a daughter named Helen, and Harriet and Helen were both uh, very significant in the influence that they had on him. A lot of people think that he was the kind of person that just always needed someone to tell him what to do. So while he was young, he was following his dad's orders, and then once he married Harriet, Harriet told him what to do, and, and when she died, Helen told him what to do. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, he actually did so much stuff. He was in Parliament. He worked for like 30 years for the in, uh, British India Tea Company, or Brit East, Brit it's on here somewhere. East Indian, whatever. The in fact, they know where his office is. You know, on, on, you know, so like, he never left London. He didn't go to India. But he worked for that company for like 30 years or whatever, um, and so on. He did leave London eventually. He uh, used to go to uh, France uh, to uh, the beach. Loved going to Avignon, and uh, in fact, that's where he ended up dying. Was there? At the beach? Kind of, sort of. Oh. Good way to go out, I guess. Yeah. He was in his, what, 80s? I think. You notice as I get older, I keep respecting the people that manage to live like 80s and 90s. You know, that's I, it's a particular interest of mine because I want to live forever. <laughs> and so there you go. Um, a spouse, Harriet Taylor, who died in 1858. So. 66. So, well, you get the idea. And what kind of things uh, uh, did he give us? Um, there it is, yes. Um, and one of the main books he gives us is um, uh, On Liberty. And it's in that book that we get the definition and of, of what a liberal is. But keep in mind that this he's a conservative. So this is the original concept of the liberal. And the liberal uh, was a liberal educated person. Uh, and all the things that sort of go with that. And, and so that doesn't mean liberal in the sense that we associate today with liberal democratic party, especially the far left, right? They would actually be the far, well, they wouldn't be the far right. but. Uh, Probably, in fact, I guess if he were alive today, he would be really conservative middle somehow, um, I would guess, you know. Um, um, looking for the utility in everything. Um, one of the neat things, though, was he was an atheist. But he also believed in religion. And so he believed in what kind of religion? Well, the problem was they understood religion to be very important for the social cohesion of the society. But at the same time, he was against the contemporary standard religions, like the Episcopal, the, the, I mean, the, the Church of England, you know, and things of that sort. And he wasn't alone in doing that. There was another philosopher who I want to uh, point out. Uh, named Auguste Comte. Who uh, he knew. Well, just out there or just, just the <laughs> I think it was the cameras. Um, I'm, sure, like I'm sure they didn't look that ugly, you know, initially because people married these, you know, folks, you know. Back then. Um, and and just so you know, this this isn't what I looked like when I was a kid. I look very different today than I did. I was cute when I was a kid, <laughs> according to my wife, who married me, right? And so you can't argue with that. Um, but so Auguste Comte, uh, a positivist, he named his philosophy positivism, which is. Right here. 
same ugly picture of it, French positivism, and it's based on empiricism, the same as utility, uh, with the focus being on the need for facts and data for you to know what a good solution, a good you know, problem solving uh, solution is. Uh, as an example, um, uh, 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 John Mill, one of his other books was Logic, a big book on logic, really big book on logic, and it was primarily about inductive reasoning. Up until this point, I, we, we've kind of talked about the difference between inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. Most of logic was deductive reasoning, thanks to Aristotle. Boethius kept that going through the Middle Ages, so you end up with all these folks familiar with, you know, the Aristotelian syllogisms, AAA1, you know, and so on. Um, all deductive reasoning, which means you can prove stuff from stuff you already know, so as long as your premises are true, you, you could form a conclusion that everybody knows for sure is true. Of course, the problem is, how do you get the premises that you know are true? Well, all along we knew that the only way to get your premises was through inductive reasoning, which is a guess, right? So there's no inductive argument that is a valid argument because it's a guess. Um, and even if it's a good guess, it's still just a guess. So it's not a guarantee that your uh, statement, your concluding statement is true, right? Um, but all of your premises for your deductive arguments are based on these guesses, these best guesses that you get. So when you get right down to it, our inductive reasoning is the, is the grounds for all our premises, and our deductive reasoning is the only way we can get uh, valid arguments. But since they're based on premises that are inductively based, our reasoning process isn't worth a darn, basically. You know, so that's pretty, pretty annoying. However, obviously we do, uh, as David Hume taught us, be practical about it. And, and remember, following David Hume, there's also the, com the Scottish common sense school of philosophy, which was based on basic, you know, practical, you know, common sense. In a sense, that's sort of pragmatism, right? Um, so as, as you get, and, and by the way, pragmatism is the belief that if you say something and it works, it's true. So that's pretty, pretty easy to figure out, you know. Take two of these and you'll feel better. You take them and you feel better. You think, oh, well, that, that's, that's, that's aspirin helps, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but positivism is based on the same kind of thing. And he also was an atheist. And here's where there's an interesting difference between John Stuart Mill and Auguste Comte. They both didn't believe in God in the classical sense of the, the major religions. But they also both believed that societies needed religion to structure uh, the society. And so they both decided to come up with a state religion that would basically replace the, the normal religions that people had, and instead what they thought was we should have state holidays, holy days, right? State holy days. So you have like the 4th of July. That's a holiday. Everybody in the, the United States should celebrate the 4th of July, um, Independence Day, right? Uh, we have other holidays too, Flag Day, you know, where you celebrate the flag. Because if you think about it, what is the flag? The flag is like a religious symbol of the United States. You know, people really get upset if you stomp on it or, you know, don't treat it correctly. There's all sorts of rules on how you're supposed to do that and so on. And on these holidays, one of the things you should do is have a parade, especially march your military, you know, and everybody go out there and cheer them on, you know, because that makes us all feel, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the Greek plays, you know, what was so important about the Greek plays, it gives the community a sense of catharsis. You know, we're all united in this experience. We're all suffering and, and crying together, you know, and we're all cheering, you know, the, 
Girl Scouts, and then the Boy Scouts, and then the Fire Department, and, the <laughs> and then Miss Eagle River, and Miss Bear Paul, you know, as they go drive by, yay, you know, we have a community, and we have statues, and we have you know, memorials, and, and so on. So, in short, what they think you should do is build a state religion. What's the sacred, most sacred document? In our state religion in the United States, mm -hmm. Declaration of Independence. De 